We are currently in our series called Simplify. You know, with so much noise in the world today and so many things that can consume our time, we want to learn how to create space for the Lord to speak to us. We're always encouraged to hear if this ministry has been a blessing to you. And if it has, please tell us at hftwchurch.org. You may also give to our ministry at hftwchurch.org slash give. I hope that this message is a blessing to you. Wrapping up this teaching we've been doing on, on how to simplify your life, really just talking about how to stay emotionally and spiritually healthy in a stressful world. And, and I was just reading my devotions. In fact, I want to give you this verse to begin with in Isaiah 26.3. This is such a blessing. It says, this is what the Lord says, You will keep him in perfect peace. Can you say perfect peace? Whose mind is stayed on you because he trusts in you. And we have said that it's the promise of God to bring an inner grace. I like to say it this way, that the peace on the inside will be bigger than the pressure on the outside. Kind of like a submarine, you know. The more pressure on the outside, the more the pressure on the inside is there. And that God says, I'm going to be big on the inside of you. Hallelujah. And one of the, the keys to this whole life we've been talking about, the simple life, is developing what we call margins. And uh, in your sermon notes, I put here, a margin could be defined as breathing room. Have you ever felt like you needed breathing room in your life? The space between our load and our limits. Remember a, a whale that was stuck under ice, and they had to break a hole in the ice so that that whale could breathe. And some of you need to breathe today. God wants to bring margins to our relationship, our spiritual life, our financial life, just so that Wow, our life becomes manageable. Margins make life manageable and create space for God to really work. Let me just read to you some of my definitions here on margins. A margin is, is the space we create for God to do amazing things in our life. It's the gift we give ourselves to go through life so that we can see beauty and not just duty. It is like having pillows when we fall. <laughs> Margins are the empty spaces on the pages of a book that make it easier to focus. They are shoulders on the side of the road to assure us that a breakdown won't be a tragedy. Margins are the gift we give people to have space to be who they are, share what they feel without the fear of being judged or corrected. Margins are spaces in relationships where forgiveness has cleared out the resentments and a new start is possible. Margins are more than enough fuel for the next leg of the trip. More than enough time to get to school, work, or to church on time. What a miracle. Margins are a giving fund that helps us be ready to bless the needy. Margins are having time and space in our day to be still and know that He is God. Margin is the freedom to know that an unexpected expense won't have to become a wearisome debt. Margin is a head start. I mean, you know, I told people I could beat any sprinter in the world in a 100-yard race if I had a 90-yard head start. <laughs> How many know God can give you a head start? And that can help you finish your race. God wants to put space in your life. A marginless life is an unmanageable. Job described a life without margin this way, Job 3.26. I have no peace, no rest, and trouble keeps coming. Has, have you ever felt like that? I have no peace, no rest, and trouble keeps coming. Some of us are like the student I heard describing finals. They described it this way. Jam it in, cram it in, more is still to follow. Stuff it in, push it in, don't try to breathe, just swallow, you know. I like the story of uh, the little kid whose dad would always come home exhausted. He'd always bring work home, more work to do at home. And so finally she, she went one day and she put her arm around her dad and says, Daddy, I think you should ask your teacher to put you in the slow group. <laughs> I mean, you know, some of us need to be put in the slow group. Get on pace where we can breathe again. I experienced the... Uh, problem of a lack of margin when I tried to take the big church van to pick up the kids at the airport this week and I was in a hurry and tried to park in a little tiny space between two cars I came within an inch it took over 
15 minutes and three people guiding me to undo myself. But, but here's the point of margin. When we intentionally create margins, we, we ease the strain and create places for God to reign. We create a place of freedom. I love this verse in Psalm 16, 6 says, Lord, your boundary lines mark out a pleasant place for me. When, when, if we listen to God and say, God, there's a whole bunch of stuff you've called me to, but there's a whole bunch of stuff you haven't. And as we say around here, the key to being effective is being selective. Choosing what God has for you to do and ignoring the rest. God, get me within that space because there's freedom if I get in the lane that you have for me. And there's just exhaustion if I go beyond that. Lord, get me in a place where I'm intentionally creating ways for, for you to show up. You know, can I just tell you something about margins? When you create a margin, you're, you're five times as likely to have a God moment in your life. For example, if you choose to take your kids to school and leave five minutes early, <laughs> how many know you're five times as likely to have a God moment with your kids than if you're five minutes late and you're driving crazy and hoping the police don't see you and, Lord, blind their eyes, and, you know, how many would agree that if you have a regular date night with your wife, you're far more likely to have, a t have connection and for God to do something in your marriage? That if you have a quiet time every day where you just create a margin, that it's far more likely you'll hear God talk to you, huh? Or if you have a teenager and you just say, look, you know, instead of just always telling them, get up and go to school, and you, you say, let's do something together we both enjoy, and, and you just create a margin. How many of you are far more likely to connect with them just because you created a space? But if you're willing, for example, to have a little giving fund, send a little bit of money to say, God, in case you want me to bless, how many more you're far more likely to hear the Holy Spirit you, speak to you and help you be, just because you just said, I, I have a place for that. I created a margin. And wherever you create margin, God is able to start to work. One of the things I love about margins is, is it, it's what God does in his relationship with us. You know, the Bible teaches us that, that God puts a margin between what he expects and how he accepts. I love what it says in, in Psalm 103, 12. It says, Lord, if you were to count all of my sins... Who could stand? But there's forgiveness with you. Psalm 103 says, You have not dealt with me according. You have not sat up there and said, Oop, you did it again. You, oop, you did it again. But as high as the heavens are above the earth, so is your mercy or your margin towards those who fear you. <laughs> How many are thankful that God says, I am going to create breathing room so you've got time to grow. And even though you mess up a lot, I don't give up on you. <laughs> It's of the Lord's mercies we're not just burnt out because his mercy is new. And he says, I'm going to give you now your 3,045th chance. <laughs> and I'm going to smile the whole time you do it over again, even though you did it 3,045 times wrong. I have given you margins called mercy. And how many know that we need to remember that? You know, sometimes we're driving behind someone, they're too slow, and we're like getting intense, and God says, hey, buddy. I gave you margins. Back off. Give them a break. Or you want to just like correct everybody and God just says, whoa, I don't come around and beat you over the head all day long. I listen to you. I love you. Give space to that relationship. Just love them. Give margins like I do. Now one of the most important places we need margins is in the area of our finances. I don't have to tell you that when you are in a time where you're underwater financially, you are in a time where stress can be unbearable. I, I don't have to dwell on this because I think almost every one of us in this room have been at some point in our life in a place where, you know, the, the days between now and the paycheck are, are bad, you know, that place where all of a sudden things just are out of whack financially. It creates stress at every level. It creates emotional stress. We got, you know, that terrible little pit in your stomach. 
that, that you're worried. Sometimes people don't even want to answer the phone or go to the mailbox. There's another notice. And sometimes it affects our spiritual life. We're not thinking about God. We're just saying, how am I going to survive? It affects our relationships. How many have wasted a whole day arguing with your spouse about money? Don't raise your hand. You've just wasted it. You spent what? Whoa, yeah, woo, just all of this. And, and it's just like it created no margin in your relationship. It just took and sucked out the air of that relationship. And I want you to know today that it is not only possible, but it is a promise for us that God would help us create financial margins in our life. Look at 2 Corinthians 9 and, and verse 8. I just love this great verse. It says, and God will generously provide all. Can you say all? All you need. Then you will always have everything you need and plenty left over. Can you say plenty left over? <laughs> to share with others. How many would say that describes the way you'd like to live? Anybody think? I, I would like to live that way. You know, God has made a promise here, and He wants you to hear hope this morning. He wants you to hear that no matter how many times you've messed up financially, how many would just agree here that there's a whole lot of financial sinners in this world? By that I mean people like me who've made really dumb, stupid financial decisions. Is there just one person in the crowd who's ever made a stupid decision? I've done it on a regular basis. It's a gift I have. But anyhow, I just want you to hear this, okay? There, there's nobody here that has it all together. There's nobody here that would say, I would be fine with someone putting all the financial decisions I've made on a billboard on the freeway. <laughs> there's none of us here that at some point in our life didn't just feel a little bit ashamed. That we have done something for money or because of money or worrying about money that really got us off track spiritually. That, that we have allowed money to make us, as they say, money can make you funny. Have you ever met people that were real cool and then you got in the area of money and they got weird? This is my message this morning. Money can make you weird. And I, I've seen it in some of our lives. They're just like the nicest people and then you threaten something about money. Woo! Oh boy, did you push a button. Get out of town. Well, I want you to know that God can give you financial peace. That's the message this morning. That you can have financial peace. That there is a place that God will help you get to. Could you imagine waking up a whole day and not feeling stressed about money? Being, being completely at ease about it. Being relaxed. Just knowing that God's in charge, that you, there's enough, and that you're able to think about blessing others and not just worrying about your needs. This is what God has promised to help us. And I want us to look at a story of how God brought someone out of financial bondage. It's a beautiful story found in Luke chapter 19. And I want you to just be aware as we begin to talk about how God helps us create financial margins by understanding something it must start in our heart you see here's what I want to tell you today and that is when Jesus becomes your treasure money becomes your servant when Jesus is not yet the treasure the center money will come and control you in harmful ways the first key I want you to understand about financial peace. Financial peace is not about how much money you have, but how much contentment you have. You see, I know a lot of people that have plenty of money, and they're still burdened and wrecked. I know people that, that more money doesn't solve anything in their issues. See, I find that giving people more money, it can be like a workaholic. If you give a workaholic less work, it doesn't cure them from being a workaholic. <laughs> if you give a person in financial bondage more money, it doesn't cure their financial problems. 
Because finances are first and foremost an attitude of our heart. When God becomes the treasure, it's amazing how finances begin to come into a place of peace instead of a place of stress. So let's look at this story. Jesus entered Jericho and made his way through the town. There was a man there named Zacchaeus. He was the chief tax collector in the region, and he had become very rich. He tried to get a look at Jesus, but he was too short to see over the crowd. So he ran ahead and climbed a sycamore fig tree beside the road, for Jesus was going to pass that way. When Jesus came by, he looked up at Zacchaeus and called him by name. Zacchaeus, he said, quick, come down. I must be a guest at your home today. Zacchaeus quickly climbed down and took Jesus to his house in great excitement and joy. But the people were displeased. He has gone to be the guest of a notorious sinner, they grumbled. Meanwhile, Zacchaeus stood before the Lord and said, I will give half my wealth to the poor, Lord. And if I've cheated people of their taxes, I will give them back four times as much. Jesus responded, Salvation has come to this home today, for this man has shown himself to be a true son of Abraham. For the Son of Man came to seek and save those who are lost. Now, this is a very familiar story. And I bet you most people in this room know a couple things about this story. Number one, they know that Zacchaeus was a wee little man. (laughs) And most know that he was very rich. He was the richest guy in town. And that he climbed up in a tree. But what I want to ask you to probe on is what drove Zacchaeus up a tree? (laughs) You know, you can't really say, well, he was just curious. He wanted a a Jesus autograph or something like that. You got to understand that for the richest man in town to climb a tree was to choose social embarrassment of a severe kind. People were going to make fun of him. His, quote, status would just really be questioned, seeing that rich man in a tree. I believe that what was driving Zacchaeus was something way deeper under the surface of his life. Mother Teresa said that real poverty has little to do with what's in your pockets and everything to do with how empty your soul is. She said that the most severe form of poverty is loneliness. The worst poverty in the world is feeling alone. It's spiritual poverty, not financial poverty. And here is a man who had all the wealth, but money had done nothing for him. He was empty. Here was a person who who was filled with baggage about all that he had done because of money. And it was seeping out the pores of his heart. You, You could sense that he must have thought, look, I've heard about this miracle worker, Jesus, and he's come along people who've wrecked their lives in all kinds of ways. I need a miracle. Nothing but a miracle can free me from the burden that I feel inside. And what I love about Jesus is that when Jesus comes and sees Zacchaeus in the tree, he doesn't look up and say, you financial sinner, you! You cheater, repent, you're going to hell, you know. But Jesus does what he always did. He looked past all of the faults and he saw the need. He saw a lonely man. And he said, hey, how about if I come over to your house for tacos today or whatever it was? That's all he said. But what he said spoke to something far deeper than what was wrong and messed up in Zacchaeus' life. He spoke to what was empty in Zacchaeus' heart. And as Jesus walked with Zacchaeus, we don't have details at that point, but we know Zacchaeus had a grace encounter. And when grace invades us, it changes us. Here's what a grace encounter is. It's the moment you see yourself in the eyes of Jesus And it's this incredible mixture in which you know, number one, I'm I'm more guilty than I ever thought I was, but you know at the same time, I'm more loved than I ever dreamed I was. 
I can't make excuses for what I've done. Here is the king of heaven who knows everything about my heart. It's all on the table with him. And yet when he looks at me, I don't feel one bite of condemnation. I feel like I'm the treasure that he would die for because he did. When that happens to you, it melts your heart. When that happens for you, it inverts everything in your life. I can't even describe it unless it's happened to you. See, before Zacchaeus got his status from his material wealth, but suddenly that changed. It wasn't money that defined him, but it was the king of the universe is a friend of mine. Before, money was his security, and that's where so many people live today. Boy, I've got to have enough things so that my life will be under control. And, and all of a sudden, now Jesus is my security. Before owning things made him feel like he was valuable. And now knowing that he was valued made him not care about what he owned. The moment what I call financial salvation happens in your life, you change in this mysterious way from being an owner of things to being a steward. From needing things to define you and secure you to being able to use things as tools that are just gifts from God to glorify Him and to bless others. A miracle happened. The idol of materialism was removed from the center of his heart. Mammon was no longer king. I can see it developing because when this happens, all of a sudden you see everything through Jesus' eyes. You, you see those people, oh, those are the ones I cheated and I, I thought they deserved it. But now all of a sudden it's breaking your heart because you're seeing things as Jesus. That's called being born again. Has it happened to you? No one has to tell you that's wrong. Your heart is breaking because you see for the first time what Jesus sees. So before he could do anything, he, Jesus never says a thing about money, but he says, I'm giving away half of what I've got, and if I've cheated anybody, I'm giving four times as much. And Jesus just laughs and says, see, salvation has come. Someone said, when Jesus opens your heart, your, your wallet comes right afterwards. You can't help it. When God is so good to you, you can't stop from being good to others. It just happens. No one tells you. It just, whoo, your heart's now free. Can I ask you, have you had a financial encounter with Jesus yet? Have you had an encounter where his grace touches you so that now Jesus is the treasure? And now things don't matter the way they used to. They're just tools for him. You will not have power to sort out things for God's glory until that happens. See, for some people that happens the first time they're saved. But for most people, financial salvation comes at a later time in their walk. That's what I found. In fact, for many people, the last thing Jesus is able to conquer is their finances. They'll give their sins real quick. Here, take my sins and take my children. Oh, yeah. Oh, and and they'll go through the list. Jesus, you can be Lord of this, and you can be Lord of that, and I don't like my job anyhow. Be Lord of that. And then God says, well, how about your treasure? Well, just a second, Lord. <laughs> when the people in the Middle Ages were converted, some of they called them the barbarians, the Visigoths and the Franks, they, they all requested, they said, could we be baptized, but could we keep our right hand out of the water? They said, well, why do you want to do that? They said, well, we want to be Christians, but we'd still want to be able to kill people with our sword, you know. <laughs> and, and that's sort of ridiculous, but how many know there's a lot of people who would like to be 95% baptized? But could I please, Lord, just keep the wallet out of the water? You know, let's just go ahead the rest. You know what I'm talking about. But Jesus said financial peace comes when he's the Lord of all. Jesus is either Lord of all or he's not Lord at all. When he's Lord of all, the very heart of your life towards everything, including your material possessions, changes. If you've never had a financial encounter with Jesus, this is a very good day to experience one. <laughs> Once you have done that, then there are some choices you can make to create financial margins. 
And let me just give them to you. Five biblical choices. Number one is the choice to live joyfully in contentment within God's current level of provision for your life. The most important margin is the margin we choose to create between what God provides and how much we spend. And of course, in our world, that margin gets really fuzzy because in a world of, of easy credit, we are taught by our culture, if you don't have enough, just charge it, right? And we, and we end up completely, as so many of us have experienced, falling into life being choked by debt. 80% of Americans owe more than they own. At the root of that, sometimes there's things that are unavoidable. Let's just be honest. Sometimes there's medical emergencies and so forth and so on. But beyond that, there is so often something else that drives us, a discontentment. I've got to have that. Even though it's beyond what God provided, I wouldn't say this. I would say, God, you just didn't provide enough, so i got to go to Visa today, you know. But this lack of contentment can bring incredible bondage, but contentment can create margins. Hebrews 13.5 says, keep your lives free from the love of money and be content with what you have. Because God has said, never will I leave you and never will I forsake you. One of the most powerful verses in the Bible, Philippians 4.13, we've probably quoted it, which says, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. And we like that verse, and I've heard it used for winning football games and, <laughs> you know, trying to win the lottery, all kinds of weird things. But the real context of that verse was Paul talking about how he faced financial uncertainty in his life. He said, look, sometimes I have more than enough. That's awesome. Sometimes I financially abound. But he said, other times I have very little. But he says, here's the secret I've learned. I know how to be content with a whole bunch. And I know how to be content if I just was in a shipwreck and all I have is one pair of wet clothes. Or if I've just been thrown in a prison cell and I have nothing but bread and water. But I have learned that the power of contentment comes through Christ who's there to strengthen me. That when Christ is the, the treasure of your life, he can present into you a great peace. And I have seen it on the lands of places like Zambia, people of unbelievable happiness who have almost nothing. I, I have seen it in, in the faces of people who they just worship the Lord because they had a couple of tortillas down in, in Honduras for that day's meal. But there was something else in their life much deeper than the material. And it was the presence of Christ. They believe with all their heart, Jesus has provided everything I need for my present happiness. I don't see it, but I believe it. And somehow deep rivers of contentment flow. That allows the second kind of margin, which contentment allows you to save money for emergency needs. Savings are building margins, and I like to say building margins are making good decisions in advance that can help you avoid making bad decisions when the pressure's on. This, this idea that some people would say, well, I could never save money, and yet I can tell you, I've seen it over and over, that when people say, God, I know that you want some financial margins so that when my car breaks down and Murphy's Law starts kicking in, I am not stuck in that horrible place of having to go deeper in debt. I remember when I first took the Dave Ramsey Financial Peace Course, and you know we were struggling getting all that stuff figured out. And I remember one thing that just stuck out of me. He said, whatever you do, get a second job. Do whatever you do, to, but get that $1,000, what he called, emergency fund in a savings account. Don't ever live another day without, without that cushion, without that margin, and and I couldn't believe that when we were able to, to, to do that, suddenly a peace came. There was a leverage point to deal with the unexpected. Suddenly, as that savings grew, there was a, a sense, wow, we are not going to be victims all of our life. And I found that God was very ready to help accomplish that task. 
Number three is honor God with the first tenth of your earnings. Many people think, well, this is crazy. Already all my financial margins are, are used up, and you're saying, and then give the first tenth to the Lord? What is that about? Well, what is so interesting is that God understands that creating margins is, is not simply a numbers game, but it is, a, it is a walk of faith that opens doors for his supernatural involvement in every area of our life. So that's why Malachi 3.10, this very famous verse says, Bring all the tithe into the storehouse, that there may be food in my house. And put me to the test, or try me in this, says the Lord, if I will not open for you the windows of heaven and pour out for you such a blessing that there will not be room enough to receive it. I will rebuke the devourer on your behalf. Even though our natural mind doesn't understand it, the Bible says over and over that giving creates the margin we need for receiving. Proverbs 3.9 says that, he says, if you will bring the tithe into the storehouse, then your barns will be filled with plenty. Here is this idea, sometimes I call it, it's like exhaling air. What happens when you exhale air? <sighs> You create a margin, you have to receive, right? And God says when people give, they create a margin that I will feel. And it's the only way. You rob yourself, he says, if you do not learn the secret of the margin building potential of giving, you will rob yourself of God's supernatural involvement. That's why he says here, he says, this is the only place in the Bible where God says, put me to a test. Nowhere else about any other subject does God say, here's a 90-day trial, or whatever you would call it. Here is a test. He finally says, I dare you, I double dare you with a double dare. Just try it. And his point is very simple. Why would he say that? He would say, because... This is the most simple and practical way to learn the very essence of a margin-filled life, which is trust and faith. You see, to live a life of margin says, I trust that God is going to work. How can I take a day off and a day of rest when there's so much work? Because I believe God is able to figure out how to run my life on six days better than I could run it on seven days. How do I take margin to to wait on the Lord in the middle of a busy schedule because I believe the government's on his shoulder. He's going to, but how, how, do I, how do I do that? It's because I believe. And God says, I want you to believe a crazy thing and, and prove it to you, that God will help you live better on 90% than you can live on 100%. I dare you to test me and see what happens. Because at the point of testing, suddenly we find out Look at these verses in Psalm 34. Put God to the test. See how kind he is. See for yourself the way his mercies shower down on all those who trust him. Anyone who trusts him, Romans 10, 11 says, will never, never be disappointed. <laughs> and after 35 years, I can tell you, and I've had these all the way down to my first job, and we were about to have our first baby, and I go into work one day, and I get a paycheck and a pink slip. <laughs> don't bother to show up for work tomorrow. I don't know what I'm going to do, and I'm panicking, and I'm saying, you know, God, do a miracle. And the only miracle God says is to speak to my heart and say, don't forget to tithe on that check. I say, what? Are you kidding me? I, I don't have a job now. And all I could hear was test me in this. And I remember writing that check, sending it off. It's okay, you know, not a great man of faith at that point. But I, I literally walk to a park and start to shoot baskets, and somebody drives up to the park, zooms up and screams out the window, hey, dude, do you need a job? I don't know where this guy came from. And that day I got a job making $2 an hour more than I had the day before. And I began to see throughout all my life that the only way I would ever have the supernatural involvement of God, what only God can do, is if I walk by faith and not just by what I could do. This does more than just 
provide for a margin. This provides purpose because so many people think the goal of financial freedom is getting from point A to point B. Point A is being messed up by that, and point B is having enough money. But God says, are you kidding me? Is that as far as you want to go? That is not my financial plan for your life, to go from point A to point B. My financial plan is for you to go point A to point B to point C. And point C is that you will become a blessing to people. That you won't just be a big fat reservoir. You'll be a river and that God will pour through you his, his abundance so that you can bless the poor. You can bless the missionary. You can have more enough in every occasion to do the good work that you long to see happen. That's what money's really about. Why stop at point B when you can go all the way to point C? I just love this, this testimony. A uh, pastor was sharing. He said, recently a young couple named Ryan and Chelsea has shared the story of their financial reconciliation. Their struggle with debt began during the planning stages of their wedding when they said yes to expenses that were beyond their provision and paid for them, as many of us had, with little plastic cards that sat in their wallets. Within the first weeks of our marriage, Chelsea said, those bills came due, and we soon found ourselves buried in debt. The total amount was enormous. We were ashamed at how foolish we had been to rack up such a debt, and we were overwhelmed. The financial strain of those bills put their brand new marriage on the rocks. They fought regularly over how to manage their debt they were under. The honeymoon was over. But this bright young couple, rather than wait until their marriage crumbled or the bankruptcy court was their only option, sought help. They signed up for the financial class at church, and they said, we learned to develop some great tools for having productive financial conversations. We decided we would cut up each credit card as it was paid off. We cut up six credit cards during the 10-week class, and we set the goal to be financially free by the end of the year. It was an impossible goal. But somehow, as we stuck to the plan, God began to work in ways we had never thought. We ended the year a week ahead, completely out of debt, with a joy and freedom we had never known. Because they were now living beneath God's provision, there was margin to respond to the me- a need. An email came about a need in the ministry that, both, that was to dear to both of their hearts. Chelsea said, God placed a really large number on my heart. When Chelsea presented it to Ryan, Ryan said, that's 10 times more than my number. But I sense God is telling us to do it. And they were able to do it on the spot. They said, for the first time in our lives, we were able to give over and above our regular time. And writing that check was the most freeing and joy-filled experience. We have continued to live this way and have discovered, I discovered, Ryan said, my wife has the gift of giving, which keeps us always exciting to see how God's going to lead her next. But through this courageous decision, they have come to a place of joy and freedom, they said, that they thought they would never know. Just two other final things that I think are so key. We develop margins by developing a united spending, saving, and giving plan through good communication in our home. You know, one of the ways that I've found that if God is ever going to get control of finances, both husband and wife (laughs) have to find a way to be one in agreement. I have learned from the beginning of my marriage and through counseling so many people that just as God has a plan for our marriage, Satan has a plan for our marriage. And can I tell you one of the top things on Satan's agenda for our marriage, and that is to mess with our marriage through financial stress. It seems that the enemy is constantly trying to find ways to use money to put a wedge between husband and wife. And the main way he does that is he gets them on two different agendas. I have found it just crazy, but I find couples all the time that are driven to keep secrets from each other and to to handle their financial issues as if they were not even married. And before you know it, they are creating all kinds of confusion. What I've learned about good communication about money is the time to build margins is to have the conversation before you spend the money, not after you spent the money. Some of you have learned that one the hard way. 
But there is an incredible grace when a couple gathers and prays in Jesus' name each week. All right, we're having our financial council meeting. God, how do you want us to use this? What's the wisdom here? And God comes and begins to create a breakthrough in that family. So we need to understand a path of contentment. Create the savings plan. Give God that first tenth. Begin in a very strategic way to have united prayer. And just the last one I felt I should mention was giving our best effort at work as a gift of worship to the Lord. In Colossians 3.22, I love this verse. It says, Servants, obey your earthly masters in everything, and do it not only when their eye is on you to win their favor, but with sincerity of heart and reverence for the Lord. Whatever you do when you work, do it with all of your heart as if you were working for the Lord, not for men, because you know that you will receive an inheritance from the Lord and that He will reward you. You know, God says if you want to create margins of blessing make a careful effort when you do your work to work not for a paycheck how many know if you work for a paycheck money is your master if you work for people people are your master but if you work for the lord the lord is your master and basically he's saying i'll give it the simple as i can when you go the second mile, that second mile is recorded as a margin that God says he personally is going to bless in your life. When you, by the grace of God, say, you know, my boss might not notice this. People might not appreciate this. But I am literally doing a level of excellence here with an attitude of graciousness that's so much more than I required. And the reason I'm doing it is for Jesus. And if no one else cares, it doesn't matter because I am not a slave of people. I am a servant of the Most High God. And if I'm flipping burgers, I'm flipping burgers for Jesus. Bless His holy name. It doesn't matter what I do. It matters who I do it for. That's what matters. And the moment God sees that heart of worship in your work, He says, I have ways to promote you that you can't imagine. I take good care of my employees. You just watch and see. I will open doors. I will change you positions. If you're a prisoner like Joseph was and your best job was working in a prison, I can make you prime minister of all of Egypt tomorrow. But I am the one that promotes, not man. And I just heard a testimony talking about his dad, and his dad was in the worst part of the Depression, and and somehow he always had enough, and he asked his dad, he says, well, what happened? He says, you don't understand. He said, nobody hardly had work. But he said, I went to work not because I had to go to work, because there was only a little part-time job I could find. But I went to work to worship the Lord, and the Word of God said, six days you shall work, and the seventh you shall rest. So I got up every day and said, I'm going to work, even if I don't have anywhere to go to work. And so he began to volunteer for companies that couldn't pay him. But he just said, I'm going to work for the Lord. And every time he ended up with another job and he ended up with another. Not because of the economy, but because he was absolutely working for the Lord. Today as we, we close, I want you to ask the Lord, which of these five ways of creating margin? Maybe the Lord wants you to think about. Maybe the Lord wants you to pray about. Maybe it's, Lord, I just really need to let you deepen my contentment. To accept this level of provision. It's not going to be forever, but if it's for now, God, let me find a joy and create a margin that says I can live beneath what you provided for a time so that a margin exists for you to give me peace. Maybe it is that savings that you say, Lord, by faith, I'm going to go out Monday and I'm going to start to save. Maybe it is that whole area of giving your tithe faithfully to the Lord. Maybe it is the marriage coming into agreement. Or it is just a new attitude as you go to work this week. God wants to bless you and honor you. Would you pray with me? Why don't we just stand in closing prayer as we, we finish up here. But... Here's where I want to close today. What would it mean to have a financial encounter with Jesus like Zacchaeus did? For Jesus to come 
in such a way to your life that you would say, Jesus, from this moment on, you're going to be the treasure of my heart. From this moment on, Jesus, I'm not going to be an owner of anything in my life, but I'm going to be a steward for you. I'm not going to get my identity or security from the material world. My identity is going to be in you, God. Lord, I'm going to live life in a whole different stream than the people around me. I'm going to live life as a steward who says, God, the reason for my material possessions is not me. It's all to glorify you, and it's for you to use just as you will. But, Lord, it's all just for the glory of God. Jesus, today, come and be the Lord of my possessions. Would you pray this if it's in your heart? Jesus, be the Lord of what I own. Be the Lord of my work. Lord, be the Lord in our family budget. Be the Lord of our heart as we deal with the pressures, dealing with issues of debt and patience and waiting upon you. Be the joy of our family, Lord, that we won't compare ourselves with others and get sucked into a lifestyle that just takes us deeper and deeper into bondage. Lord, be the the Lord of just how we see our work, that we go tomorrow to just serve the Most High God with our very best, knowing that you will be the provider for our life. Be the joy and the treasure of our hearts, Lord.